But let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. And I pray as always that this message is a message that you, our God, have for this, your people. Father, help us to do what you call us to do. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. Well, we are going through that devotional. I hope you're going through it on Wednesday evenings, the Lenten devotional. We have a couple left there in the back. So if you haven't picked one up, you can still join us. I'm choosing, uh, you know, uh, one of the devotions throughout the week in order to base the sermon on. And so this evening, I'd like us to turn to Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Colossians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians... Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Colossians, and he wrote it from a prison cell. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. It's good to see you, King. Amen. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Say amen if you're there. Hallelujah, if you need more time. All right, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We're going to stop right there. I'm going to focus on verses 5 through 6. Such wonderful advice. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. What do you think he means by outsiders? People outside the building? People who are outside of the faith. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing this from prison. When he says walk in wisdom and Who imprisoned him? Outsiders imprisoned him. Do you think he's saying, hey, be wise toward those outsiders. They might imprison you like me, and so you don't want to end up like me. Is that what he's saying? No. He is not upset about being in prison. Well, he's probably upset, excuse me. But that's not what he's talking about. See, Paul had an aim. Paul had a goal. What was the Apostle Paul's aim? What was it that drove him? We talked a little about about his aim about a month ago. The Apostle Paul's goal, his goal in life. What was the Apostle Paul's goal in life? For to me, to live as Christ, to die as gain. That was his goal. That was his aim. For to me, to live as Christ and to die is gain. To live as Christ, to die is gain. So the Apostle Paul said, hey, if me being in prison is where I need to be because it'll benefit the ministry of Jesus Christ more that I'm in prison than in prison I shall be. And if I die, that's a gain to me. I go to heavenly glory. For to me, to live is Christ and then I is gain. So let me ask you, what is Jesus' primary desire then? If his, his thing was my primary desire is to do what God wants me to do, What's Jesus' primary desire? What do you think? What's Jesus' primary desire? To save souls. Jesus died. He rose again. And then he gave last standing orders to his disciples. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Make disciples. 
You know God's primary desire by what he's willing to do. He'll sacrifice everything else in order to meet that desire. What God ultimately wants is for you to go to heaven, to be with him forever, to rise again at the return of Christ and live forever with him in a new heaven and a new earth. That's what he ultimately wants. He wants you in a relationship with him for eternity. Now you're here on a Wednesday night in March. I'm going to believe the best. You're here because you love Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. So God has achieved his primary desire for you. You have a relationship with God. Your sins are forgiven, right? You've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You believe in Jesus Christ. You trust in him, and I believe you. So the primary desire that God has for you has been fulfilled. So why do you still draw breath? Why are you still here? You know, uh, there's a sign, if you notice, it used to say, buckle your seatbelt when you leave. I'm going to give somebody a challenge, and hopefully somebody takes it because it's not me. There's a sign as you leave our uh, driveway, parking lot. It used to say, buckle up for safety. I want that little sign to read something different. It's all worn out. It's even turned upside down. It looks terrible. So I want the sign to say, you are now entering the mission field. That's what I want it to say. You are now entering the mission field. Because I'll tell you why you draw breath. You continue to draw breath to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's your children. That's your parents. That's your neighbors. Whatever. But that's why you draw breath. That's why you continue to live here. To fulfill his primary desire, which is the salvation of souls. You know it. For God so loved the world that what did he sacrifice? His only begotten son. Remember, you know your aim by asking yourself the question, what would I be willing to sacrifice in order to keep? You know, that's your goal. So, okay, that's why you exist. So, all right, that's why Paul existed, to make disciples, to be used by God to spread his word so that other people would believe, which leads him to then say these words in 1 Corinthians. To the Jews... I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. What does he mean? Well, just as an example, Timothy was a half Greek. He had a Jewish mother, but a Greek father. He did not get circumcised. So when he got into ministry with Paul, did the new covenant demand that Timothy be circumcised, yes or no? No. But when Paul went to Jerusalem, he looked at Timothy, the grown man, and said, <clears throat> Hate to break it to you, buddy. But I think that's going to have to get snipped. I think you need to get circumcised. Was it so that Timothy could be right with God? Was it so Timothy could be forgiven? No. Basically, it was, these guys are going to make a big stink out of you not being circumcised. And I, it's too exhausting to fight with them about this. So because they're weak and they don't get it, Go ahead and be circumcised. So when they come and ask, is Timothy circumcised? I get to say what? Yes. And then I can talk about what I want to talk about. Timothy was a grown man. This wasn't day eight. Imagine that process. What Timothy went through, to the Jew, I became what? As a Jew to win the Jews. Then in Acts chapter 16, Titus has not been circumcised. And Paul says, no, 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 you're not getting circumcised, Titus. Because Paul was making a different point. Paul was showing the Gentiles 
that they could believe in Jesus Christ without becoming a Jew. So Titus was encouraged to not be circumcised. To the Jew, I became the Jews what? To save the Jews. To the Gentiles, I became as a Gentile to save the Gentiles. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save them. Basically, what I'm trying to say is Paul knew his audience. We're going to have to turn that off. I, I, yeah. Paul knew his audience. And having known his audience, he said, how can I best communicate? Because what's my aim? What's my goal? To win some. So instead of asking my audience to morph to me, I will morph to my audience so that they might be saved. It's a very important little principle. To win them to Christ. Paul wasn't being fake. He wasn't trying to morph himself into what other people wanted. That's not it at all. He was attempting to achieve the goal. He learned the Jewish way. He was raised in the Pharisaic way. So around those people, ah, that's fine. I'll do it the Jewish way. Not that I already know I don't have to, but it stops a whole lot of garbage, and it makes them more receptive. Then when he would travel over to Athens, let's have a pig roast. Okay. Uh, and, and, and he would go ahead and have his little pig roast and his shrimp feast, and he, he would have his Gentile way. To the Gentile, I'm going to be like the Gentile so that I can save the Gentile. All right. <clears throat> let's not pretend that we don't have a hard time doing this. How often do we ask other people to understand us instead of us asking, how can we best understand them? And our goal is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. What does he mean by making the best use of the time? What is the best use of the time? The best use of the time is to bring people to Christ. That needs to be in the forefront of your mind. So let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt. Salt is a spice that brings out flavor. I mean, yes, it's a preservative. Uh, yes, uh, it had wealth as well. But right now, I think we're just going to stick with flavor. Salt is good, isn't it? Amen. Amen. I've said it before, I'll say it again. An egg without salt is nothing but mucus. But when you add salt to an egg, it turns into a majestic, beautiful thing. You know, Brian uh, and Beth aren't here. Hannah is sick. But, you know, they've got this new company called Mediterranean Basil Salt. I don't know if you've seen that. But I actually love the spicy Mediterranean Basil Salt. So I have four eggs every morning with my sausage or my scrapple. And I pour that salt... A hard-boiled egg without the salt on it is a granite pile of garbage. When you pour the salt on it and you eat it, ah, it becomes a delicious thing. All right. The point here is salt draws out the flavor in a thing. So it says, make your speech. The best use of the time, that means your focus is on, I want to give Jesus what? To this person. I want to give Jesus to my kids. I want to give Jesus to my husband. I want to give Jesus to my wife. I want to give Jesus to the grocery store clerk. I want to give Jesus to the people I don't know. I want to give Jesus to every single human being because that is the best use of the time at work. That doesn't mean you always have to be talking about Jesus. At work, you might be doing the best job you can the most productive thing you can, being honorable in your work, because by doing that, you are giving them Jesus. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that when people encounter you, they know they've encountered a different flavor. They're used to mucus eggs, and you're going to give them Mediterranean basil salt. You know what I mean? And they're going to know the difference. What is it about this lady? What is it about this man? I'll tell you what it is. It's Jesus. Christ deals with us, all of us, uniquely. You know, he does this. You know, Christ, even through his word, speaks differently to me in different situations through his word. I'm not hearing audible voices. 
but you hear me. He speaks differently to me in different situations and contexts. He knows when to be gentle, and he knows when to be gruff. He knows when to be patient with me, and he knows when to press. He knows exactly what to do and when to do it. We need to begin to learn an art, and that is how to communicate with different people in different situations under different contexts. We're so arrogant that we are expecting everybody to just accept me for what? For who I am. They need to accept me for who I am. There's a place there. But you know what? You should be wanting them to accept who? Jesus Christ. So if I have to change a little bit to give them Jesus, that's precisely what I need to do. Perfect example. I don't speak to an elderly woman steeped in the Lutheran church who's been singing page 5 and 15 in the TLH uh, her entire life, and I go visit her in a nursing home. I don't speak to her like I speak to Scott. <laughs> but I think there's a reason there. Scott wouldn't want me to talk to him in that way. Why? Because that would be weird. It would be like standoffish almost. It would be like, what's wrong with you, man? Perfect example. So we all know that I'm divorced. When my first wife left me, <clears throat> and we went to a, we went to court, and uh, the two of them had to be a witness, and I needed to have a witness with me as well. I brought Scott. <laughs> all right. So uh, we're in court. And, uh, you know, they say what they need to say. And then something hit me. What hit me was when the master, uh, she wasn't a judge. She was like a master or whatever. Magistrate, something of that nature, whatever. She asked, I remember this, she asked Mitty, because she was going to be remarried in like 14 days, okay? So it was just a 14-day period. It was two weeks, you know what I mean? So the magistrate said, do you want to change your last name? And she said, yes. So she went back to her maiden name for a 14-day period of time. For some reason, that hit me, okay? Like, wow. Mm, the way I took it was, you can't even hold on to this for 14 days. All right. And that hit me. That hit me hard, okay? So I get in the car with Scott. We're driving away, and I'm sad. Sad. Scott looks over at me. He says, what did what, you think you were going to do today? I said, oh, I'll get divorced. He goes, good. Well, you, you're now you're divorced, so shut up. <laughs> so I started dying laughing. And I was like, man, you know you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, and I got in a much better mood. See, my point is, if Scott put his arm around me and goes, it's going to be okay, Chris. Everything's going to be okay. I'd be like, get off of me. Who are you, you moron? What? Stop it. Uh, the point is, he knew what? Who he was dealing with. And what works. Other people wouldn't be able to take that in the spirit in which it was given. Does that make sense? But he knew me. And he knew, dude, I'm going to make fun of this guy incessantly until he laughs, and then it's going to be okay. He's going to walk through this. <clears throat> in the same way, there was an individual in church uh, who, a lot of times people, and we do this all the time, they're looking from the outside in. They don't understand what's going on behind the scenes in order to rectify a situation. They don't get it because they're not involved in it. Does that make sense? All right. So this individual thought that some level of church discipline should be taking place that they didn't see taking place. That we were going through a particular process with uh, an unrepentant sinner, and we were in the middle of that process, but they didn't see any of that going on because it wasn't their business to see that it was going on. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm at a wedding, and this individual is pretty gruff. They're gruff in the way that they are. So I'm at a wedding. I remember this vividly. And because I'm at a wedding, I don't have my phone. So they left a message. And it was something along the lines of, you weak, nasty, 
pastor. God calls you to do this thing, and you're weak. You're so, you're pitiful, and I can't believe that you would do this, how weak you are. So this is the message, and it's just like gravelly, too. So I'm like, all right, got it. So uh, I call him back, and I say, who do you think you are? I said, you don't know anything. Don't ever tell me what I am and what I'm not. You have, you're ignorant, and you have no idea what you're talking about, and your attitude has not affected me at all. So I need you to be quiet and let me be the pastor, and you just sit down. You know what he did? He started laughing. He goes, wow, you really put me in my place. He goes, all right, I totally get it. That was it. Now, do you think that I would normally speak that way to anybody else? The answer is no. What I knew was that person. I knew what works for that person because I've had a long history with that person. And that person would not respond to, well, what I need you to do is just sit back and let's just talk this out. Because he already thinks that I am what? Weak. To the weak, I'm weak. To the strong, you need to be strong. You follow what I'm trying to say? So it's just that simple. <clears throat> I've made many mistakes, but these are all lessons. Jesus spoke quite differently to Pharisees than he did to others, didn't he? You know, a uh, couple people, it's never written, but some people believe that Jesus himself had been raised in the Pharisaic tradition because a lot of times you can speak to people uh, when you're from them in a certain kind of way that you can't if you're on the outside. Does that make sense? So a lot of people kind of think Jesus was raised in the Pharisaic tradition, which is why he not only knows them, he felt a certain level of freedom to what? Go hardcore on the Pharisees like he did. Because there's a way to talk to the people you're from that you don't talk to others. Does that make sense? You can say that to your mama, but don't let anybody else say that to your mom. That kind of a situation, all right? Jesus spoke very differently because they needed to be communicated with differently. He knew how to speak to a broken reed who was filled with sin. Look at Jesus' communication to the woman at the well and compare that communication to the Sermon on the Mount and compare that communication to how he speaks uh, before Pilate and how he speaks, every situation demanded what? A different thing. Because what was Christ's goal? To save them. His goal was to save them. There's a famous 60s song that quotes the Bible. Uh, I know you've heard it. To everything turn, turn, turn. You've heard that song, right? <laughs> it goes kind of like that. Better than that, but kind of like that. Thank you for the encouragement, Beth. All right. So the book of Ecclesiastes says this. I know it's small, but I wanted to fit it on the screen. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What in the world is Solomon getting at here? It looks like he covers everything, and everybody's supposed to be everything to everybody. And actually, that's precisely his point. Sometimes... We need to go to war. Sometimes we need to be at peace. Sometimes we got to destroy a mountain. Other times we got to build one up. What do you need? Wisdom. When is it the right time to do all these things? And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. 
Know who you're speaking to. Know your context. <laughs> I remember my old man, young Chris. I learned this lesson from my old man. My father was very good at this kind of thing because he was a communicator. So I'm young, probably 12, 13. And the Agni family, uh, especially extended Agni family, were of the evangelical Christian tradition. So proper in the way that they did things. My nuclear family was, let's just say, a little less proper. All right? So my father told me a joke when it was just us that I thought was really funny. And I laughed. Ha, 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 funny. I retold that joke <laughs> in the group. Nobody laughed, but my father, to his credit, let me tell it. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew it was going to bomb. He knew I'd be embarrassed. He knew I'd turn all red. And then he just leaned over and he goes, Chris, this is an excellent lesson. Know your audience. And I never forgot it. He said, <laughs> he said know your audience, young man. That's what you've got to learn. You've got to learn who your audience is. This joke plays great with Dad and Chris. This joke don't play so great with Dad's brothers and sisters. Know them. See, doing things the Christian way is a lot harder work, isn't it? See, we're used to walking around saying, everybody except me for who I am. No. No, 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 no. No. It's your job to accept them for who they are. To the Jew, I become a Jew to save the Jew. Without compromising, by the way. Compromise nothing of your faith. That's not what I'm saying, and I hope that's not what you're hearing. What I'm hearing is your aim needs to be how do I what? Reach them. How do I reach them? It's just like <laughs> when the Lutherans came here, uh, we said, we got we to gotta make those Native Americans Christian. So we set about teaching them German so that they could learn the Bible in its proper original language, you understand. <laughs> this is the mentality that I'm talking about. Instead of coming to them and doing what? Learning their language, we demanded them to learn German so that they can speak with us. That's what I'm talking about. That's the whole kind of idea. <clears throat> Paul said one thing that sticks with me. It's another image. It's not speech, but it's an aroma. He said, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Basically, what he says is, everybody that meets me knows that they've encountered someone that loves Jesus. Some of them, it's an aroma of life. Have you ever smelled decaying flesh? Decaying flesh or rotting flesh is disgusting. It has a very unique smell. He says, some people, it's an aroma of life. To some people, it's an aroma of death. Either way, meaning if you don't like Christ, you're not going to like what? Me. If you don't like Jesus, you're not going to like me. Nobody ever encountered Jesus Christ and said, eh, I could take him or leave him. Isn't that amazing? No one ever encountered Jesus and goes, eh. Jesus either elicited tremendous devotion and love or abject hatred because he's God. Paul did the same thing. Nobody encountered Paul and said, oh, eh, whatever. They always knew. With him comes Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves that question. Is that our aroma? Is that what we're putting out there? Do people know? Let your speech be seasoned. Make the best use of the time. 
because the world needs saving. Amen. God is good all the time. Father, we thank you. You're a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, help us be wise in the way in which we speak, knowing, Father, that with us comes Jesus Christ. In your precious name we pray this. Amen.